in collaboration with the Cyprus Mail. This is the Cyprus News Digest with Rosie Haralambos. Coming up on the programme this week, Greek Cypriots and Turkish Cypriots join together to call for the punishment of vandals who torch the Denia Mosque. This time is not enough. The mosque to be restored. It has to be verified to the punishment of the people responsible. Seven rare and endangered griffin vultures have been found dead in the west of Cyprus. We used to have a healthy population of the griffin vulture in Cyprus. Unfortunately, that decreased dramatically. And actually, a few years before we had the program to introduce these birds in Cyprus, our census showed as little as 10 birds. And Cypriots suffering from a rare kidney disease may be among the first to take part in clinical trials of a promising new drug. Showing that this same drug, which is being tried for rheumatic disorder, could be used to treat these patients with this medullary cystic kidney disease. We've spoken before on the program about the work of the Bicommunal Committee for the Restoration of Cyprus Cultural Heritage. One of the leaders of that committee is Dagis Haji Dimitriou. He joins us at an event that has been organized to condemn the destruction of the Denia Mosque, which was one of the projects that the committee worked on. Dagis, you must be very upset that after all the hard work of the committee to restore the Denia Mosque, what actually happened? It was set on fire? This it was an unfortunate event. It created uh, a lot of uh, sorrow and trouble to all of us. But, uh, of course, uh, what we say uh, today the committee is that we shall not give up. We shall continue our work. We shall, of course, repair the mosque, restore the mosque, the damage uh, it uh, happened up to now from the arson, and uh, give the message to the people that uh, some uh, extremists, some fascists, will not destroy the world of uh, understanding, of cooperation about a future peaceful Cyprus. It's not the first time, I think, that the mosque has actually been the target of an attack. What Mm. happened last time? Yes, that's the problem. It looks that a group of people, a group, because the villagers there were very upset, disappointed with the event, angry of what happened, and this indicates that uh, a small group of people from outside criminal action... Yes, but from outside the village... Uh, of course, nobody knows from who are coming. I cannot say, but for sure, uh, is not representing the feeling of the villagers. I hope that the police, uh, the investigation they are doing, they finally will uh, find the people involved and be punished because this time is not enough. The must to be restored. It has to be verified uh, with the punishment of the people responsible. How much is it going to cost to restore it yet again? And does it mean that that money will have to be taken away from other projects that you were working on? No, no, no. The Republic will pay because we pay a lot of money, about 120,000 euros to repair uh, this mosque was repaired from ruins and became a very wonderful uh, monument, uh, mosque, uh, symbolizing the cooperation and the coexistence uh, yeah, among the people in the area and for the whole of Cyprus. So the cost now is not too high because, uh, fortunately, the fire squadron went uh, soon and uh, caught the fire. It's about five to six thousand euros only. And once you've restored it, is there any thought of perhaps putting in some closed circuit cameras or something uh, so that you can prevent this? Because, it, 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 because it's not the first time it, we, one we, dares to yes. worry that it might not be the last. Uh, we are thinking about it, but uh, the most important the thing for the protection of the most 
is the people involved to be found and punished because no camera uh, will be enough to protect the monument if we permit these kind of actions to continue taking place. But there is a positive side to this, and that is an event that took place at the Home for Cooperation that brought together people from both sides of the divide in Cyprus to condemn this heinous crime. Yes. And we have a common interest to work in this direction because what we are afraid of is that the one, one extremist can feed the other extremist. And where shall we go if we leave Cyprus against the hands of extremists, of fascist elements, who in the past created such a great and damage and a catastrophe in our island. So we have decided to work together, uh, condemn and join forces for the future of the island. We hope uh, a future uh, peaceful for all Cypriots. And it is all Cypriots who come to the event from both sides of the yeah. divide, of all ages as well, yeah. which is rather nice. How did you get the word out and who actually is here today to complain, condemn Look, and uh, demand uh, uh, some form of punishment as and when the police find the perpetrators? Uh, it's just actually a spontaneous uh, meeting. It was not organized by a big organization. So it's uh, a symbolic uh, action, a symbolic event, but we think with a great message to the people on both sides. That is Tagis Haji Dimitriou from the Bicommunal Committee for the Preservation of Cyprus Cultural Heritage. Keep up to date with events in Cyprus and around the world with the Cyprus News Digest. Cyprus has for years tried to nurture its griffin vultures. They are an endangered species. We've even gone so far as to reintroduce some that were brought over from Greece. So shock horror when it hit the papers last week that seven birds had been found dead. From BirdLife Cyprus, Natalie Stilianou joins us. Natalie, first of all, a little bit about the history of the griffin vulture because it was quite a while that we had them everywhere and then suddenly they seemed to disappear. What was the original problem? That's right. We used to have a healthy population of the griffin vulture in Cyprus and fortunately that decreased dramatically. And actually a few years before we had the program to introduce these birds in Cyprus, our census showed as little as 10 birds. And when we're talking about a species that only produces one egg every year, and they have to be at the age of approximately four or five, you understand that this is a very slow process and it's very important to maintain the population. So it was a tragic development that seven birds were found dead. Three of these birds were birds that were released within the framework of the program, the YIBAS project, uh, which was carried out under the cross-border cooperation program Greece-Cyprus 2007-2013. Those are the ones that were brought over here from Crete? That's right. Are the Crete birds the same as yes. the Cyprus birds? Because yes. this is an endemic species, isn't it? No, it's not an endemic species. It's the griffon vulture, the Latin name is Gibbs fulvus, and the birds that were brought from Gre Crete are the exact same species. 25 birds were brought over, and after process of them getting used to their new environment, they were slowly released. Into the wild. Exactly. And it's the program that we have in Cyprus is actually considered very successful in that the Greek birds uh, socialized very well with the Cypriot population. So they got on together? Yes. yes. And did they make babies? I'm not entirely um, sure about, but we have a census twice a year to be able to monitor the populations of the birds to see the active nests and to be able to have a good overview. Uh, so do we know how many we've got on the island now? Well, the last census was end of January and that estimates that we have between 23 and 28 birds. But as I said, that was... Before uh, these seven were found dead. Yes. So it would probably be safe to estimate around 25 but um, it's difficult to know because they're free-roaming birds, so we can't know if the seven that were found dead were counted in the last census. Some of them have tags, so it's a way of identifying some of the birds, but not all of them. So do we know what killed these birds? 
Well, it um, wasn't hunters, let's be clear on no, that, that, which makes wasn't. a change because in the past we have had cases of hunters shooting these birds, but I think they've learnt that that really is a no-go area now. So what killed them? As you said, it's not hunting. We had x-rays done, so that's not the cause. Uh, the three possible reasons are poisoning. So one would be primary poisoning, meaning that the birds may have eaten poisoned bait, which we consider to be unlikely because in such cases, usually you find the dead birds in a very close proximity, which was not the case. The second possibility is death by secondary poisoning, which means that the birds may have eaten an animal that had eaten something with poison. So a rat or something like yes. that? Okay. And the third possibility is that the birds ate an animal which had been treated with non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Um, they're called NSAIDs, which are extremely toxic for all vultures. And they also happen to be the main cause of the serious population decline of three vulture species during the 90s in India. And we're talking about a decline by 99%. What animals would be treated with these drugs? Are we talking farm animals here? Um, Are we talking pets or what? In this case, it would probably be farm animals, but this is actually why we're waiting for the results of the... Um, Toxicology tests. Exactly, so that we know exactly what the cause is, so we know what action needs to be taken. The authorities are to say if they're using uh, these uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs officially or if they're used unofficially, we need to find out if this is actually the cause of the death of the birds. And um, we need to find out fast before many exactly. more birds die. How long is this process going to take? Um, this we don't know. We don't know when to expect the results, but we hope that it, it should be very soon because this is very critical because we're talking about a very small population of birds left. I mean, even before the recent losses, the population could not be considered sustainable. Yes, if you had another five, so, then a quarter of the population that's left has gone, probably. Exactly. So it's a very pressing matter. So I guess that the, the real message that you want to put across until you can find out the exact cause of death is certainly that we need to try and control, for example, any form of poison that is put indiscriminately in areas where vultures may be feeding on carrion of animals that die. And I'm thinking again back to the rat poisons and those sort of things. Yes, no, poison is a very, very big problem, indiscriminate, as you said, and it affects also other birds other than vultures, unfortunately, through secondary poisoning. So this is uh, also a problem that needs to be tackled. Well, we're going to keep our eye on that story. at Bird Life Cyprus and Natalie Stiljanou talking to us about the death of seven griffin vultures recently, which has really cut the, we hoped, expanding population quite seriously back. They are an endangered species. When we find out what killed them, we'll let you know. In collaboration with the Cyprus Mail, this is the Cyprus News Digest with Rosie Haralambus. The biggest achievement of Crime Stoppers has been the ability of the public to be able to give information about crime anonymously. There's no way I could have kept prostituting without the drugs. There's no way I could have had my body used like a public toilet because that's actually what prostitution is. And then the fourth series I started three days after I'd won the Oscar, so the whole of the Monarch of the Glen experience was all interplatted with the Gosford Park Oscar experience. I was working with Ronnie James Dio, and David was going to reform White Snake in 2003. Cyprus was chosen because Cyprus is a stable, peaceful, and uh, secure place. We have to really look closely. What are we doing with children? What are we doing with adolescents? And what are we doing with adults that can help them move into a more literate uh, situation? The ones that I'm proudest of are the ones that were true discoveries, where we found something we didn't know existed. There's some more exciting research going on at the University of Cyprus. Cypriot patients who suffer from medullary cystic kidney disease, that's otherwise known as MCKD, 
are likely to be among the first who will be eligible for clinical trials with a promising new drug. The University of Cyprus, in collaboration with researchers from the Czech Republic and the United States, have been working on this. And to tell us all about it, it's a welcome to Professor Konstantinos Veltas. Konstantinos, first maybe you should just explain about MCKD. It's a bit of a mouthful, but it's a fairly unusual kidney disease, I think. It, it's a disease which is supposed to be rare. It's among those rare disorders. There are clear, uh, near to 8,000 diseases which are considered rare. And one of them is uh, medullary cystic kidney disease. And it affects the kidney in, in a peculiar way in the sense that many people who are affected with it because they inherit it, it's a heritable disorder, don't really realize it uh, until it's well progressed, at which time the kidneys fail and they need to take action. And a good percentage of them, actually most of them, at some point in their life, adult or age, will reach end-stage kidney disease and they need to go on dialysis or receive a kidney transplant. So if, with this new drug, as and when it gets tested, if it does what you think it might do, will it be something that can prevent that later stage if the disease is caught early? That's the idea. This is, the, this is what we all hope. This disease, just to explain a little bit of the genetics of the disease, it's an autosomal dominant. This means that somebody inherits it from one of their parents. And the chance of receiving the disease, if one of your parents is affected, is 50%. So every child who is born to an affected parent, mother or father, runs a 50% risk of uh, inheriting the disorder. Now, can I just ask you, there's a higher incidence of this, I believe, in our Paphos area. Do we know why? I will explain. Um, but let me finish saying that it affects equally frequently men and women. And... One of the characteristics of the disease is that it is uh, of late onset. In other words, people may live for decades without realizing they have inherited the disorder, and then they start feeling that they are getting sick because their kidney starts failing. In fact, if they do some proper specific um, tests in the blood, they may find out that, the, that, that their kidney function is failing and that there's a progressive course. There's no genetic marker that can be tested for in order to the see the only who's at risk and, and maybe keep an eye on them to get it early? Yes. The first genetic marker is the one that we had discovered uh, more than 16, 17 years ago here in Cyprus, studying families from Paphos. Uh, our group, in collaboration with clinicians, for example, um, Dr. Christopher Stavrou, and Akis Pieridis, especially Christopher Stavro in Bafos. He's the guy who really studied most of the patients, if not all of the patients, in Bafos. And with our involvement, uh, we were able to do what we call in genetics, we were able to map for the first time the gene. So we were the first to prove that it's a genetic disorder, and we mapped the gene. Why is it so frequent in Bafos? It's what we call in genetics a founder effect. Apparently, hundreds of years ago, somebody came up with a disease. He had many children who inherited it, and they inherited it also. They passed it down to their children and their own and, and so on. And, and I so suppose forth. back then, of course, people tended to marry close to home anyway. Close to home anyway. It doesn't matter whether they marry to relatives. Okay, This, this uh, kinship doesn't matter, or endogamy doesn't really matter. What matters is that they probably many of the people who inherited the disorder stay in the, in the, in the geography of Paphos. And that's how we ended up with most patients being in Paphos. There are patients everywhere, but in Paphos there is a, let's, let, let, let's call it a cluster, an isolate of patients. And the striking uh, thing is that based on our research results, all of these patients come from one single ancestor. So this is what we call a founder effect, a founder mutation. 
Now, does it mean that people who have this marker will automatically go on to develop the disease, or is it a risk factor, and some do and some don't? Very good question. This is what we call a monogenic disorder, which follows a strict autosomal dominant fashion of inheritance. As I said, every child of an affected parent runs a 50% chance of inheriting it. If they inherit the affected gene, they are going to develop the disorder. No one escapes. There is variation in the symptomatology, and there is variation in the age of onset of the disease or the severity of the symptoms. But everyone who inherits the affected gene is going to develop the disorder. So one of our most important contributions back then in 1998 was that we mapped the gene and we were in position to make a diagnosis well before the patient developed any symptoms or any findings associating his condition with the disease. And were there any drugs or were there any drugs available that could no. delay the onset or treat it when the disease began to show? Well, doctors have a way to advise their patients okay, on, on following them and treating them, but there is no radical cure, and there is no easy way to really delay effectively the onset of the disease. So this new drug is hugely important if it does turn out to okay, do what let, you hope, but it, it was actually a drug, I think, developed for another disease. How did the kidney connection come in? Okay. After our findings and our research in, in, in Cyprus, a group in, at the Broad Institute of Harvard and MIT in the United States did something that we, we and others were not able to do for a number of years. They cloned the gene. In other words, they found exactly what the gene is and, what, and how defective it is in developing the disease. This same group invited us as collaborators to them because they realized that we have a, a lot of interesting clinical material in Cyprus. We have most patients than any other country. In the sense that we have them in one place, we've been studying them for a number of years, and I mean, when I say we've been studying them, I mean that our clinicians see these patients and we do the genetic testing. So they, they in the United States, know that we have all this useful clinical material, and they wanted to collaborate with us in studying the patients and eventually including them, recruiting them for a clinical trial. This drug is a drug that is being developed for another disease. I think it's for a rheumatic disorder. It has not been approved yet. Okay, It's, it's still under investigations, and everybody hopes that soon it's going to be approved and cleared by the, the FDA, the Federal Drug Administration in the United States. Once this is done, obviously the drug is going to be freely uh, used by patients. But will it now, be used prophylactically, or will it be used only once the onset of the disease is seen? This is an open question. We don't know the answer. However, what we will hope at is if this uh, drug is going to be able to be used for this disease, for this renal disease, the idea is to, to use it prophylactic to prevent the onset of symptoms. Okay, who is eligible to take part in these trials? Okay. I think you're looking particularly for younger people, and after what you've just said, that makes sense. This is something that the experts are working on. And uh, a few weeks ago, we were in the United States taking part in a retreat specifically for this disorder. And this one is one of the questions that we are working on. The idea here is that there are preclinical data by the American group showing that this same drug which is being tried for rheumatic disorder could be used to treat these patients with this medullary cystic kidney disease. This is what we call repurposed drug. If this is the case, then you save time because the drug will not have to go again, through any initial phase one and phase two clinical trials. It's going to be easier to get approval to use it 
for this disease. But it will still be a trial to see Definitely. what effect it has. How Definitely. long, assuming that you get the go-ahead to start the trials, how long before you'll be able to say, yes, this works in this renal disease? This is still premature. And, and, and I don't want to create any false hopes uh, or optimism. We are op optimistic, and people are working in that, in that direction, but there is uh, still a way to go. It is our intention, and it is in our goals, to include in the study Cypriot patients. And I wouldn't be surprised if the best group is going to be Cypriot patients. Who is going to uh, participate in this uh, clinical trial depends on many factors that Most the doctors are going to have to decide. I mean, I, I mean the doctors, the clinicians, the nephrologists. One factor, for example, is going to be the age, as you said. Another factor is going to be how progressed the disease is for a patient. For example, a patient who is well progressed and is very close to reaching end stage may not be a good candidate because the drug may not work and may give a false impression that it doesn't work. So you need to take into consideration several factors. Gender, also, you may need to include patients of both genders and come up with a cohort of, let's say, 30 or 40 patients to start with. A good, probable time um, schedule could be a year or two to see whether there is uh, clues that this drug really works. One associated uh, important uh, factor, for example, is that the drug is not toxic to these patients because... Yes, what we aim at is to treat them, but at the same time, we don't want to do any harm. Having had the approval by the FDA is going to be a great indication that this is not toxic. But unless you try it in these patients, you'll you never know. And of course, I don't need to mention that all the safety checks that need to be done when you're undergoing clinical trials will, of course, be covered very, very carefully, I presume. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is a clinical trial that's going to be designed by the experts who are going to collaborate with the clinicians in Cyprus with our catalytic role because we have, we have the, the cohort of the patients, we have the registry uh, at our biobank at the University of Cyprus, and this is really what gave us this advantage and leeway in convincing the Americans that we, we can do the job. As I said, we didn't approach them ourselves. They approached us a couple of years ago because they knew from the literature that we have access to this unique cohort of patients. So from one perspective, it's a pity that we have this many patients in Cyprus with this rare disorder. But on the other hand, it's an opportunity to show what we can do. And I might mention that the registry that we maintain all together, including the Americans and other European countries, includes close to 300 patients from perhaps 10 or 11 different countries. Half of them are from Cyprus alone. Well, there you are. Exciting stuff again from the University of Cyprus. We were talking to Professor Konstantinos Veltas from the Department of Biological Sciences about uh, possibly Cypriot patients suffering from medullary cystic kidney disease being among the first for clinical trials with a promising new drug. And that about wraps up this edition of the Cyprus News Digest. Many thanks for your company. I hope you'll join me next week. Till we meet again, take care and God bless. Bye-bye now.